Thank you, David. Uh, and it's great to be here in Galway, second time since I'm the executive director of the European Environment Agency. Uh, and just to say, Laura Burke is the chair of our management board, and we are super happy to, uh, to work with her. She's a fantastic chair, so the connection with Ireland is definitely there. I have a daunting task, in my opinion, because first of all, I'm speaking to water specialists, the gathered water expertise of uh, Ireland, so there is not much that I can add to your expertise of water in Ireland, so I will not speak about that. I'll speak about something else. Uh, and the second thing is I'm, I'm not used to speaking to uh, several hundred native speakers, so you'll have to suffer through my uh, butchering of your beautiful language, but uh, bear with me. Okay, good. Um, what I want to do is, is give you a more uh, systemic European view on the challenges for water in the next decades. And uh, my colleagues working in the water domain would not like me to say it, but they're not here, so I'll say it anyway. I would say water is back. I mean, water is one of the oldest, well-established parts of the, Europe, of the environmental policy agenda. It's been there for decades. But I would say it has been a bit isolated and in some aspects rather static. And on top of that, rather fragmented. Yeah? Now it's back because we're dealing with water in a context, and that context is changing rapidly. It's you know, pressuring us to think more systemically and integrated, and it's also connected to a lot of the broader policy agendas that we are facing. And let me start with the global dimension. Uh, and I, I refer to uh, four global panels of specialists that bring together the expert knowledge on the basis of which at a global level, but also a European level, we develop policies. The, the IPCC, I don't need to explain, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which talks about yeah, the rapid, uh, rapidly changing climate and all the elements that come with that, including adaptation. Less known is the IPBES, it's the panel that deals with biodiversity and ecosystem services. Now, water is intimately intertwined with a lot of those ecosystem services. It speaks about the sixth great extinction, the first one of which we are the cause as human beings, uh, and also the linkages with aquatic uh, ecosystems and, and earth system dynamics. So that's the third one. The, uh, the second one. The third one is the International Resource Panel, which very few people know. It uh, is also one of these UN panels. It talks about uh, our systems of production and consumption and how we use resources in those systems of production and consumption. And water is, of course, one of the critical resources in our systems of production and consumption. The fourth one, the World Health Organization, um, is actually uh, really important because increasingly it links human health and well-being to the natural world. Uh, and we are working with them rather intensely, not only on pollution, which we all know, but also on the health benefits of a uh, uh, healthy environment. So those, those uh, linkages are clearly there. All four of them give the same message. You know, we're dealing with an urgency situation. Uh, the pivotal decade is sort of uh, what, how it is framed. We're already dealing with irreversibilities. Uh, including impacts on society that, that we have caused and then are very hard to turn back. Species extinction, uh, the climate system that is in a tipping point now and that, that is, has been rather stable and now will be unstable for centuries to come. We don't know where it will end. And these things are interconnected. Uh, why, why do I say all of this? Because, of course, water runs through all of this. Huh? And, and this is the broader context. If we want to deal with those challenges, it's obvious that we are not going to do it in the old way. And the old way has had two important stages. The first stage was less pollution in our economic system. The second stage was uh, make it more efficient, the efficiency paradigm, uh, where the idea was that if we optimize inherently non-sustainable systems, we make them sustainable, but of course that doesn't work because they're inherently unsustainable. Yeah. 
And, and now we move to a third stage in EU policy making, in, in, in global thinking and scientific thinking, which is could you please reinvent your sector within the planetary boundaries, some call it, or within these challenges that we have. And that is also true for all the sectors that are intensive water users or have an intensive impact on water in the Earth systems. So we're talking about the energy system, we're talking about the food system, rather central, I think, in many of your debates. Uh, we're talking also about the built environment and, and you know, the materials we use for that, but also the whole system of industrial production and consumption, which in some cases is very water intensive or has a big impact on water pollution. Yeah? And to understand that, you can first look at these, the, the red arrow. These graphs are known as the great acceleration. If you look at uh, 50, 60 years of globalization, which can be explained as the spreading of unsustainable systems of production and consumption, and Ireland has been a key player in parts of that globalization. Uh, uh, what you see here is that the, overall the economy has improved, uh, GDP, uh, all of that, but also our resource use, including water. Uh, it has exploded on a planetary scale. And that is also illustrated by the shares of surface water bodies, uh, and that's the dark green bar here, and uh, significant pressures on them. Uh, diffuse pollution can come from a lot of uh, sources. Atmospheric pollution, uh, which I think uh, people somehow underestimate. Atmospheric pollution ending up in water bodies. I think it's one of the underestimated elements. Abstraction. Hydromorphology, uh, I, I heard at the dinner yesterday that you discussed that yesterday and I, I walked around on the other side of the windows here this morning and all the infographics also have some hydromorphological elements to them. Uh, point source pollution, which I think we've addressed better than other sources of pollution because it's easier and less systemic. Voilà. So that's, that's where we are. Yeah? The, the second part of these Earth, uh, the Great Acceleration graphs, looks at the impact on Earth systems. Uh, and if you look just at the top uh, layer, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxide and methane, you actually have the energy system, the food system, the industrial system, they're at the top, yeah, because that's where these things are coming from. But it also has had a serious impact on water. Uh, if you look at surface water, and the condition in which it is after 50 years, 50 years at least of policy, it is uh, rather deplorable, if I could use that term. Yeah? The ecological status is uh, in less than 50% of European waterways is good, uh, and in 50% it's not good. Uh, and this is after 50 years of policy making. So I, I mean it, it should make us reflect on pollution, efficiency, they seem to have their limits. Uh, so that's what, where we are now. If you take all of that together, you take the data which we do as a European Environment Agency, this is then what the map of Europe looks like. Uh, uh, you may think, yeah, Ireland, yay, we're in the blue, at least the southern part of Ireland. Yeah. Um, major portions of Europe are not in the blue at all, densely populated, intensive farming, intensive industry, uh, I mean, lack of policy implementation in some cases. So, but if you look at the numbers, even the color for Ireland refers to 20, 30, 40 percent of water bodies that are not in good ecological status. So the, the blue is maybe a bit deceptive. Yeah? Um, so we've got, we've got work to do. That is ecological status. Now, where is this coming from? We look at the pressures. Yeah? And we know that the agricultural sector, as part of the food system, and I emphasize that because I think we don't do ourselves a favor when we talk about the food system, to narrow the discussion to the agricultural part of it. In fact, I think it makes the discussions more complicated, more conflictual, and less solution-oriented. But, I mean, it is, it is the case, if you look at the European map, that this is nitrogen, that there is a serious issue. Yeah? Clear. 
then hydromorphological uh, pressures. Um, actually, there is a European Biodiversity Strategy 2030. Uh, it will come out later in June with restoration targets. Part of that strategy is that we will take away hydromorphological pressures on waterways by 2030 with what is called longitudinal connectivity along uh, river, uh, rivers, but also lateral connectivity, land water interactions. I think there is a lot of work to be done in many European countries. I'm, I'm from Belgium, the Flemish site myself. That interaction in many cases is non-existent anymore because all of our rivers have become canals, so to speak. Yeah? So there is quite a bit of work to be done there. This has Im implications also for how we in the agency deal with water and uh, terrestrial interactions. We used to have a water group, water biodiversity, water quality, and terrestrial biodiversity. Uh, we got rid of that. Yeah? It's now about ecosystem qualities and about integrating knowledge. And I have to say our water people were not happy with that. Our terrestrial people were not happy with that. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in the pleasing business, I'm in the leading business. So um, we said no. The, the biodiversity strategy explicitly links these two for good reasons, scientific reasons. We are moving in that direction. Yeah? So it's, uh, that's, that's an important message, I think, yeah? But work to be done. Also in Ireland, I learned at the dinner table yesterday. So, good, I will not disclose with whom I was sitting at the dinner table. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good. Other pressures are water abstraction, um, which is sort of a mixed picture in Europe. We see some decrease from electricity cooling because we change to other electricity production systems in Europe. Uh, renewables. In agriculture it decreased and then it increased uh, again and that has to do with a particular model of pushing uh, a form of intensive agriculture uh, which is linked to financing schemes and all of that and the rest is a bit stable. So you could say uh, yeah this is not an issue for Ireland um, because you are a country that has a lot of cubic meters of water available uh, per person, but yeah, we don't focus on Ireland, that's your task. We focus on Europe. I can tell you in Europe there are countries where, you know, it's one-tenth of what you have available. Uh, they sometimes also have a rather big agricultural and food sector. So, it, I mean, this is serious business and there are some unexpected places in Europe where you have a lot of rain and people associate the lack of water pressures with rain. The two are only slightly connected. And the place where I'm from, Flanders, is dark red on the European map when it comes to water shortage, water scarcity, because we use a lot of water in a rather irrational way. And so this is clearly uh, problematic in parts of Europe. Then, of course, we've been focusing a lot on, uh, yeah, you could say taking bad chemicals out of water bodies. This is part of the first uh, wave of uh, policy making with uh, the urban wastewater uh, treatment legislation, where large scale was the going rate, smaller local elements. I assume in a country like Ireland, this has received a lot of attention because of the distribution of the population. Uh, and increasingly also solutions for those who are not connected to uh, the water system uh, and that is a really important issue in some countries. Uh, if I look at my own country, the coverage of big water treatment plants is almost complete. The connection to these water treatment plants in some areas is not much better than 60-70%. So how do you deal with that? It's, it's a serious issue. It's a costly issue. And then you have uh, American and Chinese investment schemes investing in these pipelines. And you think, what are we doing? Okay. I'm just asking the question. You are the specialist. Huh? Okay, good. We have seen quite a number of gains from that. Uh, if you look at uh, the red line, it's... Uh, 
uh, orthophosphates. Uh, the last 20 years, 100% is a starting point. We took it down almost 40%. But then in the last eight, nine years, it sort of evened out. We're not making the same progress anymore. And if you look at nitrates, I mean, we've not made progress at the European level, uh, or hardly any progress. Now, nitrates, nitrogen, is a big discussion in many European countries. Uh, it has led to serious government uh, discussions, and I would say crises in the Netherlands. It's today being discussed as the hottest political topic for the government uh, in Flanders. Yeah? Uh, in France, it's hot. I mean, it, this is a big topic. And, and, yeah, we've been telling ourselves the story that we are dealing with it. Yeah? I, I don't think we have been dealing with it. Even though relative efficiency gains have been there, the overall result is not there. Yeah? It's a bit like driving more fuel-efficient cars and then getting off the plane in Dublin airport and observing the traffic in the Dublin area, yeah? with all more fuel-efficient cars, but the overall result is a moving parking lot. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry to be a bit blunt here, but uh, that's, that's what it is. Huh? All right, good. So we've got really serious work to do there. Then there are more future-oriented systemic pressures. Uh, you all know these maps. Huh? This is uh, what we expect in terms of precipitation changes uh, towards the, the last part of the century, uh, climate modeling. The map on the left is the annual uh, change in precipitation that we expect. So Ireland will get slightly wetter, as many parts of Europe. The Mediterranean slightly drier. But if you look at the summer precipitation, the map to the right, you see that, well, the Mediterranean in the summer will, will become the Sahara, huh? if I push it a bit. But into Central Europe, including Ireland, uh, the UK, Belgium, the Netherlands, we will see drops in precipitation that will be on average 10, 20, up to 30%. Now you may say, yeah, that's, that's still okay. But in Belgium, it's not okay, for example. So we are in a, in a really difficult climate adaptation discussion for water where we will have to deal on an annual basis with more water, especially coming in big rainfall events, and at the same time during the summer months with drought. We're in the middle of planting season in farming. It hasn't rained for two months at this moment. Those were things we used to be hearing from, I don't know, the Horn of Africa or some other places, not, not from Belgium. Yeah? Planting season, it hasn't rained in two months. What planet are you on? No, I'm in Europe. Yeah? So things are changing quickly. And of course, this is a map and it's scientific and blah, 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 and it may not be appealing, but this is what it looks like in Belgium. Yeah? Uh, we had the big floods in Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg last summer, unprecedented. And that other picture is not uh, the, the, Rhine, the Nile River, it's the Rhine River in the middle of the summer of 2018 where the water shortage was so severe that navigation, water for agriculture, water for electricity, and water for other purposes combined, they couldn't deal with it. So th this is what we are moving towards. Yeah? Okay, so then if we start, by the way, it was said that I would have a, a ticking clock here. It's not here. You cannot see that. I can't see it either, so it's equal. Uh, but so... <laughs> <laughs> it's Ireland egalitarian society, but I have no idea how long I'm going. Uh, <laughs> David, six minutes, five minutes, then I'm fine. Bye. I can solve most water issues in five minutes, so no worries. Okay, good. Uh, so, what, if, when we start to look at solutions, if the, if the problems are more and more understood in a systemic way, yeah, I think the, the solutions will have to come from systemic uh, approaches. Yeah? And I just here give one example. It's the food system value chain. Yeah. Again, I think we are not doing ourselves a favor by focusing all the attention in this food system on the farmer. It's, it's not contributing to uh, solution-oriented debates. 
It starts from the input industries, and we all know that our food system is in the grip of the agrochemical food system uh, industries to a large extent. We've got those who buy the produce and then transform it into food, huh? also by adding fat, sugar, and salt to everything, which, by the way, are very water-intensive products and come from abroad often. And so we will have to look at water in connection to other issues, from the input industry into farming practices, and I saw some nice infographics on how the farming sector can do that, but then food and drinks manufacturers. So if you produce produce and you limit 15% water use at the farming stage, but they're then, you're then producing some bottled sugary drink that requires 70 liters to produce, where's the gain? Huh? So, I mean, that's the sort of questions we will need to ask then in wholesale and retail, and at the end, as consumers, how do we deal with water connected to our food? So there is a lot to be thought about. Huh? So we are doing this for the industries uh, that are dealing with energy as well, and th this more value chain approach to look where the real pressure points are in the system and where the solutions are. Huh? That is also true for uh, our, our houses. Huh? where technological innovation can be really saving a lot of water, huh? uh, which is, is great, but it also will have to do with our habits and values. Uh, there are toilets now that are water-free. I can tell you that most people are not standing up and jumping up and down in joy when they listen to the concept. Uh, it's not what we're used to. It doesn't fit with our thinking of progress, but, I mean, most water in the household setting is going down the toilet, literally. Uh, we can do things about that. Yeah? Removing barriers to innovate is important because a lot of these solutions are linked to legislation or local building codes, for example, or other things. Again, it's a systemic approach. Do we understand water use at the level of our housing and buildings? How do we link it to how we reflect on that thing, are willing to change, and how do we connect it then to other things? Yeah, we've, we've done quite a bit of work on that. Then, sustainable solutions for uh, water stress management. First of all, I think we need to move from crisis management to proactive management. Um, we know what the long-term changes will be in climate. There will be a lot of variation. The variation is called weather. The trend line is called climate. We need to prepare for the trend line. And if we know that, proactive management is, is important. Yeah? Efficiency and technology, yes, we need to keep focusing on that. That is clear, and there is a lot that can be done. Then there is increased thinking also in policy circles in Europe, and not only thinking, it will be legislated. Alternative water supply measures, water reuse, yeah, in a circular economy sort of thinking, uh, desalination in southern parts of Europe, getting resources out of wastewater, yeah, uh, which is not far advanced in its implementation, but scientifically and technologically we know how to do it. Yeah. Nature-based solutions in, uh, in water. It's a bit bizarre that we have to call it nature-based solutions when we talk about water. Uh, the two are sort of, they should be overlapping in, in our conceptualization of, of uh, the future. There's a lot to be done there. And, and these systemic approaches, we, you know, it's this life cycle perspective. It's this uh, um, perspective from production to consumption. It's closing the loops. It is the connection between climate change, biodiversity, pollution, human health uh, in, in urban environments. I live in Copenhagen. Water is the element of quality of life in Copenhagen. Yeah. They transformed a harbor city into a city that, that has a vision on long-term sustainability, and water is the the element that makes the city brilliant yeah? uh, during the two summers that we have. And that's a week in June and three days in July, uh, but it's fantastic. Yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> then cooperation uh, at an international level. Uh, that I think this is really important as well, and in many places in Europe it's 
I think, critical. Uh, policy interventions are absolutely necessary. I mean, voluntary schemes are great, but we know from analysis that uh, if you don't set a clear target, I mean, the voluntary organization of how to reach that target, I think, is more fruitful than leaving the target sort of in the blue and say, well, voluntarily we will get to where we need to be. We know from analysis that that hardly ever works. And then luckily we also have new uh, methods to, to bring science to this. Eh? Earth observation, we are the main actor in the Copernicus uh, program for satellite monitoring, which has a strong uh, uh, aquatic component. Mobile data collection, all the things that some of you I think are more familiar with than myself. If you want to know what we do on this, we have WISE, the Water Information System for Europe. We've got WISE Marine. We also have BIS, the Biodiversity Information System for Europe. We have LICE, I mean, not literally, of course, but it's the, it's the land information system for Europe. We've got the forest information system for Europe. What we are now doing, in line with this integrated thinking, is creating NICE. The, yeah, the nature integrated information system for Europe, where we are looking for the connectivity. That will be a major step forward in how we create knowledge to deal with issues. So, the Green Deal, that, this is the European project. I've got 50 seconds here. Uh, now it works. Huh? First climate neutral continent. Uh, water is going to be critical. Biodiversity strategy. It will never work in restoration terms without a strong vision on aquatic ecosystems. Circular economy, water is a critical resource that we need to use in a much more circular way. Zero pollution, I think it's obvious what the role of water is. Farm to fork, I don't think I need to dive into that. Huh? It's a big discussion everywhere. Just transition. Justice in terms of water distribution, costs and benefits is a really critical issue, also on a global scale. We import a lot of water through what we import in Europe, and it's often at the expense of domestic water use in other parts of the world. The sustainable um, finance strategy with the taxonomy is focusing on water, so it's a critical element there. A new industrial strategy, I think if we ask sectors to reinvent themselves, it's not only through digitalization and through uh, material uh, use of rare earths and metals, it's also with some fundamental resources, and one of them is obviously water. So, while I have not said anything on water in Ireland, I hope that I've given you a somewhat bigger picture that might stimulate you to think about what it all means in the Irish context. Thank you very much.